We're live. Um, <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to a really exciting uh, final session in this thermodynamics block um, with Optimechanics. Mechanics. Um, uh, before I introduce uh, our chair for today, of course, we have a panel discussion, and I'm sure everyone here is very excited for that. Um, let me just quickly uh, brief uh, brief uh, things that you should all know already, but uh, just, just, to just to remind us. Um, please make sure your cameras are switched off during uh, the talks, um, apart from the panelists. Um, and the questions will be taken at the end once the chair uh, tells you. Um, and they can be put in the chat at Zoom or YouTube chat, um, and we'll pass them on to uh, the chair, which will be James directly. Um, or, of course, uh, you can raise your hand to speak directly. At this point. Um, so let me introduce today our chair for, for the panel discussion. It will be uh, James Millen. He's a lecturer at Advanced uh, Photonics uh, and, and has founded the Levitated Nanophysics Group at King's College London. He was also awarded the David Bates Prize um, in 2017 for his pioneering contributions to experimental and theoretical quantum optomechanics. Um, he has contributed in numerous ways towards thermodynamics as well um, in optomechanics, and he might even say too many review articles now. <laughs> Um, he's also, of course, the senior member in, in the Bourne Network and, and part of the Unicorn Committee. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have James chair this. Um, and uh, so, James, it's, the, the floor is yours. Thank you for sharing. Great. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. Um, of course, also, as most of you probably know, the people who do the real work are uh, Clara and Madassa and Marcus and Saba and uh, of course, Sophia, who did a lot of work in the previously. Um, so thank them all for um, uh, making sure this network runs. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking um, about optomechanical machines, but it's more generally going to be a discussion about thermodynamics and nanothermodynamics and why we should care about this topic. Um, so let me briefly introduce our panelists today. Um, so we have Professor Janet Anders, who is an EPSRC Research Fellow in the Department of Physics at the University of Exeter, and she leads the Quantum uh, Non-Equilibrium Group. We have, that's Janet, we have Dr. Nikolai Kiesel, who's an Assistant Professor and holder of a Start Prize at the University of Vienna, and he leads the Stochastic and Quantum Thermodynamics Group with Levitating Nanoparticles. Um, we have uh, Dr. Raul Rica, who's an Associate Professor at the Department of Applied Physics at the University of Granada, and he leads the Nanoparticle Trapping Laboratory. And we have Dr. Ram Uzen, who's Assistant Professor in the Fritz Haber Center for Molecular Dynamics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and leads the Quantum Thermodynamics Group, so we have an even experimentalist uh, theorist split. Um, so just to get this uh, panel session started, um, I will briefly go around uh, our panelists in this, that same order and just ask them to, to very briefly outline what their research interests are, maybe what their background is, how they got to this topic and, and briefly why they're interested. Um, and so I will start with Janet, please. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, James, and also to the team organizing these meetings, which uh, seem really, really nice and um, very well attended and, and just a very nice way of, of talking about science. Um, so, so yeah, my own uh, background is actually quantum information theory. And over the years, I've, I've moved from sort of well, quantum information theory really to, to try and understand thermodynamic processes in the quantum regime. Um, but not, well, this trajectory also took me towards more classical systems, in fact, um, because really, when you talk about thermodynamics and you want to make it quantum, you have to understand also the classical side of things first. And also, um, in fact, I, I did work with James a, a few years back because we were interested in uh, understanding some, some uh, fluctuation relation uh, business and, and using optomechanics to, to investigate this. So there's some overlap also in, in our interests. Uh, well, and, and today I continue to be interested in quantum thermodynamics, classical thermodynamics, um, not super much machines in my past research, but I'm getting more interested in them now. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. Nikolai. Yeah, hello, and uh, thanks for, for having me here. It's, it's really a great, great opportunity to talk, and um, I'm looking forward to that. So 
I I have from my PhD, I also have more of a, of a quantum, quantum experimental quantum information background, but then uh, like a decade ago or so, I, I joined Markus Aspermeyer's team and doing optomechanics. Mm -hmm. And then um, we, we decided to set up our first optical levitation system with the goal um, to, to, to go to quantum states of these like 100 nanometer sized particles or so. And uh, this is still this is still a joint effort of the two of us. But also, I, I got curious about um, about stochastic and quantum thermodynamics, and what we could do with these levitated systems uh, in this field. After Eric Lutz and, and Mauro Paternostro essentially introduced me to the topic, and um, for example, we came up with a with an all optical heat engine at the time. And today. Um, the team and I are working essentially on all aspects in this triangle of uh, information and classical and quantum thermodynamics. Still more classical because of the system. Now. Great, thank you very much. Raul. Thank you very much. I'm also very happy to be here and uh, very thankful for giving you this opportunity. Um, my background is uh, somehow different from the others. So I, I did my PhD in colloidal science and then I did a postdoc in renewable energies. I was working with supercapacitors in Milan. And then I moved to ICFO and there I started to work with optical tweezers, both in liquid and, and then also in levitated systems. Um, there I was uh, introduced to stochastic thermodynamics and also optomechanics with levitated particles. Uh, then after that period, I moved to Granada and I was working in ion trapping here in a, uh, I am trapping laboratory for a year and a half, and since a couple of years, I, I started my own group where we work with uh, optical tweezers and also pulp traps. And we are interested in uh, soft matter and uh, uh, nano machines, nano motors, and also aerosol science and some optomechanical devices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul and Ram. Hi. So uh, I'm also happy to be here. I'll uh, I'll be brief because I think we're we're eager to to start. I just mentioned that my bachelor is uh, in actually in electrical engineering, which is a fun fact. And then I switched to to physics, but I still um, um, you know like to to interact with experimentalists and make the theory uh, relevant for experiments. I'm interested in uh, quantum heat machines. Uh, what type of machines are relevant for the microscopic world? Um, and what constraints them? Are there additional constraints? There are additional constraints on top of the uh, second law that, that are relevant for the operation of, of quantum devices. Um, and how is the quantum nature manifest in, in their operation? And what distinguishes them from, uh, from classical machines? So that, that's about it. Great. Thank you, Ram. Um, and I'm sure uh, we are all very glad that it's a panel discussion, so we're not just talking to ourselves and we're talking to several other people on Zoom for a change. Um, great. So I'm going to get started um, almost probably at the topic which I, I almost find most interesting about thermodynamics I keep returning to in my mind, which is the very, very basic fact of kind of what is thermodynamics and maybe more importantly, why is it so powerful and useful for us? Um, so I don't know if maybe Janet, do you want to start off with, with what is thermodynamics as a theory um, and why is it so powerful and useful? Oh, okay, thermodynamics. Just a small question. Entire. Yeah, yeah, that's just a very small question, isn't it? So, I mean, everyone probably knows this, uh, this quote that <clears throat> thermodynamics is sort of the best and most stable theory we actually have. It's uh, one of the oldest as well. Um, I think Einstein said it, Edison said it, you know, some of those uh, old farts, basically. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, I, I, I think the main point of, of thermodynamics is that you can reduce a huge number of degrees of freedom to just a few macroscopic properties, and that makes it a very powerful theory. Obviously, this is not going to work if everything uh, has its own character. So you, if you had a, a gas where every single one of those particles uh, behaves really like a person, uh, you know, has their own character, then it's not going to work. So clearly there are assumptions that each of them behaves somewhat the same way. 
uh, and so on. But but given those assumptions and given a certain you know framework in which we work, thermodynamics is the most powerful theory that we have. And yeah, so it it of course it it, it is very important for our lives because today we use a lot of machines that we all have, cars, fridges, all these things that that are basically working on the principles of thermodynamics mm. and optimized using the principles of thermodynamics. But I think what we're going to discuss today is actually going more into the sort of small scale where optomechanics comes in as well. So so that's a bit more of a new frontier. We'll definitely get there. Yeah. So does so, anyone does anyone else have any any comments on on why macroscopic classical thermodynamics is is so useful or maybe even surprising? Well, I mean, maybe, how is it going, Ram? Yes, please. Yeah, maybe another aspect that, that manifests also in the macroscopic world is that it doesn't depend. Um, well, to a certain extent, it doesn't depend on the on the process or the you know, the, the type of engines, and you don't have to calculate the, the actual equation of motions many times. Uh, and it also makes this uh, fundamental distinction between uh, reversible and irreversible uh, uh, evolution. And that also carries in some way to the, to the microscopic uh, uh, world where I think what Janet started with, and, and uh, of course is the, the key power of thermodynamics potentially is no longer uh, applicable. In, uh, in the small world, it could be small number of particles, uh, but still we're interested in uh, um, in somehow uh, reproducing the success of thermodynamics in the, in this scale. Yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't it be great if we could describe many body quantum systems with three parameters? Fantastic. Um, and um, okay, maybe uh, Raúl. Um, May, could you maybe say something about um, why um, thermodynamic kind of machines and thermodynamic uh, engines, well, what they are and why they're useful? Uh, well, I, I understand thermodynamics. Well, it is generally accepted that thermodynamics machines are uh, devices that are designed to transfer, so to transform some types of energy into others. And uh, this includes. Uh, of course, engines, but also refrigerators or uh, just heat converters. Um, yeah, so that, that's <clears throat> what I would say here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, okay, I don't want to stay too long on our, on our big classical thermodynamics, but yes, please, Janet. Um, yeah, I was just going to add something to the machines part. So, so you just asked basically what are thermodynamic machines to some degree, and and, and I think it's interesting because, I mean, of course, what, what people learn in physics, undergraduate physics, or even also in engineering, of course, even more these days, is, you know, the machines such as, such as cars and autocycles and all these things. And they are the ones that we use every day. So there's a huge, huge application part of it that we take for granted, of course. Um, but, but that, of course, is the most important part of thermodynamics. But, but I think what we're discussing today is probably more in two other directions. So the first other direction is that we can gain fundamental understanding by looking at different types of uh, processes. So, you know, exchange of, uh, exchange of energy, but uh, even also information comes in at some point. Um, we want to understand how nature works. And, 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 and this is something that we can explore in the lab also in small scales now. And that's what we're interested in. So, so this one is not particularly applicable in the sense of we won't run uh, necessarily a small machine that's going to power our computer or so, right? That's not necessarily the goal here. It is really understanding how, the, how nature works. And, and from my point of view, which I'm hoping that we get much further down the line in this discussion too, is that ultimately I, I see the playground of the theories that we develop now and the understanding we develop in biology. Because biology is the is the regime where a lot of small processes that exchange energy happens in nature. And so what we understand now is hopefully going to help us understand nature at this level in the future. So I feel that this is maybe a slightly different now um, definition of what is thermodynamics, right? Where we start off saying it's a theory that's a very useful way of um, parameterizing a system with an incredibly large number of degrees of freedom into a few degrees of freedom. But now actually maybe you're saying something more like 
Um, it's a way of, of understanding any kind of particular system. And I don't know if maybe, I, I probably should have prepped some of this. Does anyone want to very briefly describe what is a system and what is a bath? I, I think for this discussion, if we're going down that very operational route of thermodynamics, we should start, we should start there. Um, although we'll certainly come back to it because I think it can be controversial as well. So does anyone want to jump in? Or else I'll pick on you. I think on, we can also say something about yeah. it. I mean, so I mean, we discuss here different things, right? I was I was just saying machines actually and the different levels of what a machine when studying machines even theoretically can offer us. So thermodynamics, yes, I started with saying macroscopic uh, properties, and now you're asking, well, what is actually a system in the bath? And the complete super super standard answer to this is, the bath is very large, very large, and it's got a temperature. And the temperature is actually fixed. Like think of a room, really big room, lots of gas mo molecules, and and in it you have your cup of tea, and and the question is this this is the system, and the system will equilibrate with the environment, and and that's uh, that's not actually so actually to be very clear, thermodynamics often doesn't talk about dynamics. I mean it's really thermostatics, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's to some degree ill ill named because what we talk about is how does a gas at some temperature or, or some cup of coffee at some temperature change to another state? But then we just evaluate what it's what was the heat exchange, what was the work exchange, all these things in such a often quasi-static process. So, so what we often do in, in standard theoretical physics course or undergraduate course is we look at a very narrow defined set of assumptions. And of course, this is what we are starting now to really un, 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 untangle because we're looking at much smaller system. We're looking much more at non-quasi-static processes, non-equilibrium processes. And, and uh, well, on my side, I also look on, quant on the quantum aspects of it. So all these are relatively new to the, to the field. Great. Yeah, I know I like this because it's, yes, please, Nikolai, go ahead. So, so to add also, so thermodynamics in, in general is also Quite vast, right? There's all the all the chemistry and, and phase transitions and and so on. So, so um, if we talk of system and bath, then um, of course you always make the boundary kind of yourself. When it comes in the direction of of, of engines and and motors or so, then then I guess we we often try to have the system we have perfectly under control as the system. And then the the noisy surroundings that that are there in in one way or the other as the bath. So, yeah. And while while I've got you on the line, could you maybe now we'll we'll transition a little bit into thinking about what happens when we start to um, shrink all of our systems down. So as we start to think about thermodynamics more on a nanoscale, um, how do we have to to modify how we think about uh, the theory? Well, the 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 most the most prominent aspect in when when scaling down is uh, is that that suddenly the fluctuations that come in due to the interaction with the environment um, are not negligible anymore for like big motors, cup of coffee, and so on. We 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 typically would talk about um, average quantities, and now these fluctuations come in. And, and, and what we learned essentially or what people found out over, over the last uh, many decades actually is that, uh, that in fact you can, you can learn more. Um, you can study analytically what happens far from equilibrium. So somehow there's an added value to looking at, at nanoscale systems because you can understand things a bit better there. Yep, great. And then I think at this point, maybe if I ask Janet again, because this seems like a good place to, when we're thinking about nanothermodynamics, to start thinking about some of these thought experiments, right? And how we can get as maybe, maybe even a slightly more pure view of thermodynamic processes happening as you imagine them. So um, should I pull up a slide? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, the first one, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just come in, give me a second. Right. Um, so Is this one good. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so yeah, just to say, the slides was made by by Zoe Holmes. Um, 
Um, right. So, so yeah, what, what is this about is that on the left, um, these are different types of thermodynamic thought experiments. And, and so they have been discussed in the literature a lot over the last 150 years. Um, so maybe Maxwell's demon, everyone maybe knows about Maxwell's demon sorting out uh, hot and cold or fast and slow particles and separating them. And the point is that if you, if you can do that, then you can extract work from, from such a, from such a non-equilibrium situation. Um, and then there are others. So for example, Gibbs mixing is the, is the middle uh, picture on the left. Um, so what you see here is that you have a green gas or some type of gas on the left and a yellow gas on the right. And in the middle, there are certain membranes that allow the green particles can go through the green membrane, but not through the yellow one. And the yellow particles can go through the yellow membrane, but not through the green one. And so what happens in time, on, if you look on the right, is that these gases can mix. And then you can discuss about how such mixing process can allow you to extract work. Uh, and then there's also this Feynman ratchet, which I will not explain. But the point I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up here is that these thought experiments have been extremely useful for the development of thermodynamics and our understanding of how the different aspects of energy and information con con conversation, conservation, conversation <laughs> um, uh, happen. And, and it is very, very nice that we are now in a position to actually potentially at least uh, realize such thermodynamic thought experiments, potentially with optomechanics. So that, so be, that was the point. Before yeah. I talk about the realization, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe I would ask, so in my mind, in a way, this has moved already very, very far away from where we started our discussion, where you had mm. to have an almost infinite number of particles, um, because I presume here your system is your pistons and your bar for all the molecules flying around. I hope that's, that's, that would be correct in this picture. Um, so is this still is this still thermodynamics? Uh, why why what's the relation between this these pictures we got in front of us and you know a, a car engine I suppose with with mm. um you know I don't know Ram I think maybe you had an opinion on this as well. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I think in this example you can you can see that uh, what actually makes the system thermodynamics is is the initial condition is that we do assume that initially each gas follows the Maxwell um, Boltzmann distribution, uh, possibly because it was before, even though it's a small system, it was connected before to, to some bar that brought it into equilibrium. But then you can think about, okay, it was disconnected from this large path. It has this thermodynamic initial conditions. And now you can, uh, it turns out that once you have this initial thermodynamic initial conditions, uh, a lot of what we know from macroscopic thermodynamics is also uh, applicable despite the fluctuation, despite the uh, quantum nature. And uh, this was a bit of a surprise, I think, uh, at some point, but gradually uh, uh, we understood it more and more. Um, yeah, great. And, and, and also what makes and this is more debatable, is what, what you focus on. Because in this type of system, you can, sure, you can measure average quantities and so on, but you can measure uh, trajectories or, or like individual particles, what they're doing, or you can measure uh, some higher moments of, of, of the energies uh, and so on, quantities which are not directly observable in, in the macroscopic scale, but are in the small scale. Mm -hmm. and, and now you can ask, uh, Okay, should we, you know, extend our uh, scope of what the thermodynamic observable uh, even is? We seem to have mo moved away from thermostatics a bit more in this case. Um, right. Yeah. So uh, on the on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about um, our optomechanical um, realizations of this kind of experiment. So I may well talk to Nikolai about that. But before we move on, I, Raoul, I wonder if there's anything you want to say about how. Um, you know, some of these ideas were tested in, in colloidal systems. Yeah, so in colloidal systems, uh, this uh, theory of stochastic thermodynamics has been uh, tested in many, in many situations and they have defined all these quantities, heat, work, and entropy production at the level of individual trajectories. And that has been uh, very interesting. And with uh, these new concepts that have been defined to, to consider uh, 
these quantities at the fluctuation level has been tested in different experiments with uh, DNA air beams or colloidal particles in optical tweezers. And everything seems to be quite, uh, um, how to say, clear and that the, the definitions have been shown to be valid. And, uh, that that has been a big uh, step forward in this in this new theory. Great. And why why is um, a colloidal system so some kind of in that case a small particle in a in a fluid? Why is that a useful platform in which to study these ideas? Well, it, it is useful. Uh, I would say the, the first thing is because it is a very controllable system, like in levitated particles. Uh, here, uh, uh, colloidal particles is strongly coupled to the heat path, so it is uh, mostly in thermal equilibrium with it, and uh, it is easy to define all quantities. Um, the interesting thing also is that uh, fluctuations are of the same order of magnitude of the energy exchanges that you can perform in these systems. And uh, it is also interesting because uh, biophysics works at this scale, and that, that is very mm. relevant. Because. Yeah, I definitely want to return to that in, in just okay. the, the next topic for sure. Um, great. Thank you very much. Um, and so, uh, Nikolai, this is maybe slightly unfair because it's not your um, your slide, uh, but Janet can also add anything if she wants to. But would, you don't have to follow this slide, but would you like to say anything about, about why optomechanical systems are, are good for, for studying nanoscale um, thermodynamics? So, so, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. And uh, maybe I don't follow the slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so if we, even if we look at the, at the most simple type of optomechanical system, right? Like, um, um, uh, well, cavity optomechanical system, say, where we have some kind of mechanical object and typically it would be a harmonic oscillator and then a light field coupled to it with, with maybe a cavity there. Then, um, then of course, this is, we have two very controlled systems. No, we have the light field and the mechanics, but at, at the same time, the mechanics is still coupled to a thermal environment. And, uh, and I, I think Mauro, Mauro mentioned it last week or so, I discussed it. And even there, one already can see it from some a non equilibrium steady state system where, where energy flow, heat flows from the bath thermal bath to the light field and one can measure entropy production there. But then, then of course, you want to have some more control. Like, let's think of an engine. You want to be able to change your system and you want to maybe change your temperature or so. And then this is also that like either you add something or, I mean, even, even, even with a simple system, there's these ideas of PMS where you can think of polariton modes and, and, and introduce uh, kind of a, a frequency change, which would correspond to a change of the mechanics. Um, and then, and then going further, of course, one can try to design um, systems that are uh, more complex, non-linear, which is something that levitated systems maybe are good for, and still uh, create this this um, uh, tailored environment. So, in in a nutshell, we have very good control both over the system and the environment for, for test test experiments. And what's the environment in this case, in general? Well, in um, so so the way I typically think about it, uh, the, the really the mechanics would be the system, and uh, and the light field would uh, be the tool to kind of uh, create non non standard environments. So. For example, to have an environment that looks like a squeezed environment or an environment that, that would in somehow be in some way be not thermal but colored or or non-Markovian. So so the tool to, to manipulate the environment in an artificial way. We'll we'll definitely return but, to some of those those topics about about non-standard bars at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually I wonder because is there any um, particular um benefit of having these kind of oscillating you know oscillating systems as something you use to uh, study thermodynamics or is that just as trivial as you know that that's an object that's kept in place roughly and if you keep an object in place it, it tends to oscillate is there an, anything i'm missing there is there anything special about oscillators 
No, I mean, it, the answer might be no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I think it's definitely good that it stays in place, yes. <laughs> um, um, but but yes, our oscillators is, is is already pointing out something important, and it's it's not it's not only harmonic. No, it, it could be several of them, and it could be all kinds of uh, mechanical type of potentials, so to say. Right, Janet, did you have anything else you wanted to say about about this um, topic? Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, generally optomechanics, as it was, which was Nikolai, also what you just said, is, is I think optomechanical setups are, are useful as a, as a physically controlled platform. That's really our toolbox, our playground in which we can sort of control the system, the environment, everything, and study all the exchanges of in the best case uh, of energy. And, and in a way, that the first step, of course, is to match, in a way, a theory, right? The theorist might come and say, you do this, experimentalist, and then the experimentalist goes and tries to do this. And then uh, either it works out, um, which is just a cross-check that, uh, that this is actually realizable, uh, or it turns out that it doesn't quite work out the way you intend it. And, and that part of it is very interesting because we learn something about how theory is not quite the same thing as when you do it experimentally. And, and, and that is the bit that we're really after, trying to realize things and then learning from what goes wrong in a way and, and how that then feeds back into the theory. Uh, right. So, the, so that test, the test case scenario is important for optomechanical, or is what make, makes optomechanical platforms interesting. This particular slide here is is uh, from some work from from Zoe Holmes and and, and myself and others, um, and and that was just to say that possibly optomechanics can really be used quite literally to do these thought experiments that we had on the previous page, and in particular it can study this Gibbs mixing and it can study it in a, so classically when you do Gibbs mixing, you have these two gases, which are, uh, which are either different. So say, I don't know, whatever, oxygen, whatever, nitrogen or whatever. Um, either they are completely different and then you do get a mixing entropy and a work out of it, or they're the same, like both oxygen, then you do not get anything out of it. So this is a strange thing because there's a sort of discontinuity between having either getting work from mixing or getting none. And, and the point is that in quantum mechanics, you can get, you should be able to vary the distinguishability of the two gases. So Good. we have, we have a notion of distinguishability uh, and, and the amount of distinguishability. If you think of uh, perfect bosons, for example, they, they, they should all be distinct, uh, indistinguishable. Uh, but if you think of photons, and, and that's now the point here, is that if you think of, of the left original picture and you want to translate it into a quantum picture, you can go to the right and think of this as an optomechanical setup where on there's gases on the left and the right, but these gases could be photon gases and they could have a polarization. And so the polarization of the gas on the, on the left and the right could be only partially distinguishable. And so that what it means is that we can think of those optomechanical setups as a platform to realize such experiments in a regime where they have never been able to, to be realized. Great. And I find that exciting. Yeah. And that, yes, that's a good good advertisement for why our community should be studying these ideas. And um, we'll return to some of those ideas. So I'm going to stop sharing this slide now. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this um, discussion um, seems to have been uh, quite a lot about um, how thermodynamics change at nanoscale and how we study and verify that. Uh, but now I want to talk a little bit more about why we need to study it and and why it's applicable and so i wonder raul if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, nano thermodynamics and, and uh, biology and what the relationship between those two things is well in in, in bi biological systems there are many tasks that have that are uh, being done by uh, either bacteria or molecular models inside cells and uh, there, these tasks are, are, are done at uh, energy cost. And so evaluating these uh, energy transfers and the efficiency in how these motors or engines are working is, is very important for the fundamental point of view of understanding how life works. 
and that is uh, also it's a important point. Uh, an alternative would be how to design uh, motors or engines that can perform artificial tasks uh, in these scales and how to efficiently power these, uh, these motors or engines needs to uh, needs a good understanding of stochastic thermodynamics at this scale and how this and how would you power such a such a machine uh, yeah so <laughs> that, that's the point so there are many different approaches uh, one of course is using light so you can uh, heat up a system by illuminating it with light and then uh, if the system is uh, cleverly designed it can use this uh, energy that absorbs in terms of, in the form of light uh, to, to perform some tasks. There is also other fuels like uh, chemical energy or external fields, but uh, certainly optical illumination of microparticles is a, is a good way to, to, to make uh, motors at this scale work. Mm -hmm. And maybe very briefly, uh, in a real biological system, how how does that system um you know extract energy from the environment like you know is it is it really literally a tiny little engine that's that's doing this uh, well uh, the systems that are bio systems in terms that uh, biology has uh, created them they typically use uh, chemical energy to to do work artificial engines uh, typically uh, use uh, external energy that is provided by external fields. It can be a laser light or can be an electromagnetic field, or right. also radiants that are externally uh, imposed in the, in the medium. Great, thank you. And since I've learned we have an engineer here, Ram, I wonder what other um, nanoscale machines we can, we can imagine being useful that aren't just in, in the biological realm put you on the spot there. Yeah, I think it is uh, one of the interesting uh, questions. After um, kind of doing the, the mapping and seeing how macroscopic refrigerators should work and so on, uh, then comes the question, what, you know, how can we, we broaden the, the spectrum a bit? And, um, and, and while classically it was, the, the need was very clear, uh, um, you know, all these uh, steam locomotives and so on. Uh, here it's less straightforward, but doesn't make it uh, less interesting. So uh, some people are thinking about, for example, generation of entanglement when the resource is thermodynamics for some, uh, uh, some uh, thermal gradient. Um, so they have an uh, interesting research the recent papers uh, about this. Um, uh, we have been exploring how to use uh, thermal machines for uh, for uh, thermometry or for more generally for um, for metrology. And um, so the task here doesn't necessarily have energetic interpretation. Okay, it's uh, something completely different. And also the the figure of merits are not necessarily. Um, work or, or, or something of that sort or to cool something just to improve the precision okay so it's a completely different question but again the the initial conditions are, are still uh, fits the thermodynamic schemes and um, and the, the idea is still the same that using two equilibrium uh, at least two equilibrium environments uh, you can create a non-equilibrium state that is useful in some way um, Great. So I think th th these types of uh, machines are, are very interesting, but it's hard to, you know, it's, uh, I think it's, we start to see some, uh, this topic uh, picks up. Thank you. Um, yeah. Would you believe we're already over halfway through if we want lots of questions? Amazing. Um, so I want to move on a little bit away from, from being quite so um, applied and into a little bit about fundamental physics. So we've kind of said, you know, although the, the, the platform here is not for telling people how stochastic thermodynamics works, but by studying these systems, um, there is new physics which we have uncovered and have learned. Um, so I wonder if um, maybe uh, Janet, do you want to 
briefly say anything about this topic, maybe in relation to fluctuation relations or theorems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, so So just to, uh, I don't know what the audience knows, but so, so the old fashioned thermodynamics, everything is large, everything is sort of behaves in a very predictable way. But what we are saying is that when, when you go to a smaller scale, like what Raoul is doing with colloidal particles or, or indeed quantum, quantum scale, um, it won't be like this anymore. You have very, very large fluctuations. Um, and there is this thing called fluctuation relations of different kinds, which basically quantify how far away. So basically, in, instead of one big peak with a very narrow width, you have a very broad peak and lots of fluctuations. And, and understanding that is very important um, because I really think that in, in biology, these could be the things that make everything happen. It might not be the center of the peak that is important for lots of biological processes, but the outliers, the very high energy events, for example, that are rare, but high energy or very low energy or so, you know, it could be like that. And understanding that is, is crucial for us to understand biology in the end and at this level. So what do cells do? How does energy flow? How, how, how do things um, move? And, and yeah, again, I think optomechanics is a fantastic platform to, to study this from the, from the physics point of view. But the translation to biology is what I'm, what I think will be the future. Yeah, um, I think that's also where there's there's a great challenge in terms of um, in in terms of if you try to understand those processes without using the stochastic thermodynamics, having dealing with these outlying fluctuations is very very hard in some kind of digital simulation on the computer. Uh, you really need to to think about it in the right framework where these fluctuations are raised to the to the level which which matches the role they play. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can say one more small thing on the theory side. You you basically asked like what can you what can we learn, right? And of course, uh, what I just said was slightly more experimental and and sort of somewhat practical in the sense of biology applications. Um, but also even from the theory point of view, um, it gives you a tool to analyze data. So th these fluctuation <clears throat> relations. So you can. Uh, for example, um, there's some work that, that we are doing with people who do molecular dynamics simulations, and, and they are interested in finding, for example, free energy differences of certain chemical reactions. And the question is, how do you get them out? And of course, you could do it experimentally, like, like what Raoul was uh, talking about earlier with tweezer experiments, where you really measure the non-equilibrium nature of things and from that extract delta F, but you can also do it with simulations. And, and then extract from that delta F. And that could be very useful because you can, um, it can help you design, you know, understand how you should design certain molecules, uh, how you should mutate certain molecules to, to find certain properties that you desire. Because if you went through the entire space of possibilities, it's too much. So any information that we can gain from such applications of narrowing the potential space of possibilities that we should explore, that's already amazing. So mm -hmm. I, th I, th I see a lot of potential. And Raul, can you think of an example where these experiments have, have led us to understand something better about how a biological system works or the underlying physics? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not really an expert on these experiments that I'm thinking in, but I know that some, uh, they have uh, these uh, molecular motors that work, that transport some cargos inside, the, inside cells have been measured. So they've measured with optical tweezers the, the, the step size of the individual steps of, this, of these machines. So they, they very well understood how these molecular motors work inside cells. And that was a very, very, very interesting result. Um, and a lot of experiments that have been done with uh, with uh, DNA chains and RNA chains also. It's, these experiments gave a lot of information about the biomechanics of the biomolecules, and that's very, also very relevant for biophysics. Great. And Nikolai, I know certainly in, in our field and, and work that colleagues of ours do, um, you know, we, we start off by, you know, saying that thermodynamics to the theory of equilibrium states, but people seem to use these thermodynamic systems to study non-equilibrium physics. And I know that's something you're interested in too. So how can we study non-equilibrium physics using thermodynamics? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I think this is really one one thing where where the benefits lie, lie and what we can do now. I mean, tuition theorems. This is uh, something that some something that kind of is is helping us um, to go beyond um, beyond slow processes, staying close to equilibrium. Also beyond this uh, linear response expansion of thermodynamics, to to look at really really fast processes, and to understand then um, how how entropy is produced in the in the in the process, and I think uh, we learned a lot there, but but there's still many many open questions in understanding this very fundamental um, background quantifying it and, and really this is understanding the ir irreversibility of such processes and uh, will certainly be a component in, in, in analyzing such systems. Uh, if I may, uh, I would also like to add um, to the point before, um, when, when we think of studying biological systems. So uh, I agree that this is, a, this is a huge and important playground I think that also, also um, we already created another pl a playground in a sense because because when we think of how how memories work uh, like real memories or how um, or how little energy harvesting systems work, this is this is coming from the engineering side and this is working in a domain where 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 these concepts uh, where these stochastic processes are, are relevant. And um, I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity to also understand how these systems can be improved with what we learned of the of the stochastic thermodynamics in the recent years. Yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Maybe um, I want to add a small comment, yes. if I can, about you know maybe to the to the defense of classical thermodynamics. So. Um, it actually deals quite a lot with non-equilibrium processes, um, uh, but of a specific type, uh, I think. So in, in any heat machine, you will find in general, the system is, is out of equilibrium and you will have gradients and gradients of temperature are already not, not in equilibrium. And also irreversible processes, thermodynamics deal with irreversible processes. And in fact, you have the fact that you have equation of states or even if you really stray away from, from uh, equilibrium, the system, in the end, it will relax to equilibrium. And you can say a lot about the final state by the fact that you can calculate it along a reversible process. So this is something really powerful in thermodynamics that lets you deal also with non-equilibrium uh, uh, systems. I think when, when the system is small uh, and when it, many times we're actually interested in the state of the system before it really relaxes, to a thermal state because many times this is the, the interesting thing uh, and, and therefore we need this additional layer of, of non-equilibrium analysis. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with you, Ram, as we, we move on a little bit and we think about some of, some of the open challenges uh, in understanding um, thermodynamics and nanothermodynamics. So, you know, it's 1888, I'm in Germany, I'm wearing a top hat, I'm looking at a steam engine, uh, or at least a steam box. And it seems very obvious to me that I have very few uh, dials I can turn. You know, we've got pressure, volume, and temperature, and arguably number, right? Um, is, is this a sufficient set of useful parameters for us to describe thermodynamics now that we're starting to think about nanothermodynamics? And even now, you can start to think about quantum thermodynamics. Right, so I think it, it's still possible to restrict yourself to small number of uh, uh, of elements, and but the point is that this is not a necessity. Uh, uh, sorry, of observables, uh, it's not a necessity. And for example, in in optical lattices, uh, called atom in optical lattices, you know, just take a, a photo, a fluorescence photo, and see the, the position of individual atoms on the lattice. Okay, so you can calculate the, the average density and and so on. Uh, but you can also calculate any any moments, and, and uh, you have much more information essentially available at the same price. Same goes for superconducting circuits. When you measure the uh, the population of the qubits in the end, whether it's uh, 100 or 300, it's 
almost as easy as calculating the, their uh, the, their average value to calculate the individual realization and, and therefore have information on any other moment or, or a correlation and so on. So information is more uh, accessible many times in experimental setup. And that poses more challenges if we, we want to understand it from a thermodynamic point of view. And, and sometimes we have to because the evolution is so complicated that we simply don't have any any other alternative. We cannot do the dynamics of, of, uh, of 70 spins, right? So um, thermodynamics can come in handy. And maybe also in the context of uh, a critical process uh, or something like this that I'm trying to connect to what uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, so that could be related to some specific feature. I don't know, maybe when two particles, sufficient number of particles are close enough together for a certain process to, to happen. And it, it, it's not related to, to the average energy or the work you have to invest or something like this. So there are finer questions that could be motivated by uh, some operational uh, uh, processes that are of interest. And how do we know that we've captured the, the a, a sufficient range of observables to to understand the energetics of our system? How, how do we know if we've missed one? If, if um, not obvious well, anymore? so uh, if, uh, there are not too much uh, equalities. I mean, there are fluctuation theorems, and and, uh, and and then you have something exact, and you, you have a clear relation between uh, observables. Uh, when it comes down to, to inequalities like the second law and so on. So uh, if you miss out things, you might have a bound which is, which is potentially too tight, uh, too loose uh, to actually be meaningful. And when you add more observables, you can have uh, uh, stronger constraints. And, and the simplest uh, example that was actually only recently explored um, is... Uh, for example, if, if uh, you think about the second law, but you also impose a certain conservation law, not, not energy, but other conservation laws, um, then the dynamics is more restricted. You will not be able to saturate the, the standard bounds because of these constraints. It wouldn't let you implement the, the, the equilibrium process that leads to the saturation of the second law. Uh, so even this is true even without conservation law, just by the very fact that the the the, the bath are small, so they will go out of equilibrium, and therefore the the second law will not be saturated. But it is possible to add uh, more observables or to uh, more information sometimes, not not necessarily observable about the system, in order to get bounds that are, are tight and, and that can be saturated in this small system. So I think this is an example that you learned that you actually uh, added more relevant information. Great, thank you. So I just want to ask a couple of questions that are maybe a bit more around realizations here. And so Raul, I mean, how easy is it to really extract these quantities from experiments? I mean, are there, are there quantities um, that are important that are extremely hard to extract from, um, from experimental systems? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, well, this question I, I would like to connect with the previous one a little bit. Uh, um, regarding what you said, if how do you say how do you know if you have uh, identified all the degrees of freedom that you need to? Uh, fluctuation theorems are useful for that because you know that fluctuation theorems have to hold in any in any experiment. Uh, therefore, if you haven't considered all the or the contributions, for example, that you should take into account to energy to entropy production, for example, you your experiment, your results will deviate from what the fluctuations theorems uh, uh, predict, and then you know that you are missing some key, key ingredient in your description. That's the the thing I, I would like to say. Oh, that's very that. useful. Yeah. No, I actually forgot to mention, but we we actually exploited this in order to detect heat leaks by. Mm -hmm. observing that some constraints don't hold and then you can detect, say that there's additional environment that um, disturbs yeah. the system, so, sorry. No, that's, that's uh, extremely useful. And regarding the last question, 
uh, where what we measure typically is, is displacement in an optical tweezers. And, and how, you, how well you can detect motion is strongly uh, uh, related to the level of noise in your system. Therefore, it is clear that what you have to, to do is to minimize uh, external sources of noise in, in your case. I guess that's where it becomes very useful to have a well-defined system like an oscillator in a tweezer because from motion you can then derive all of these useful parameters. Okay, um, um, before we move on to talking about uh, quantum, uh, Nikolai, I, and this can also uh, overlap with quantum as well, um, um, what are the challenges in kind of realizing these these kind of model systems, these thought experiments um, in the lab? You know, how easy is it to, to make a controllable bath or a system where you have full control over all the degrees of freedom? <laughs> I'm tempted to say. I oh, know what a time to freeze. <laughs> oh, hold on, Nikolai. Oh, you were sorry. tempted to you were tempted to say what? <laughs> <laughs> am I am I understanding you're back. again? Yeah, you're back. Yes, so you back. said we heard you. You said I'm tempted to say. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, I'm tempted to say it's easy. <laughs> no, so uh, so of of course of course we learned a lot over the time. Things that hadn't been easy are easy now. Yeah, so I I. I well, I think that I think that um, it depends really on what you want to do, right? This kind of um, little engines in a harmonic oscillator or so on, like we see in colloidal systems or also in levitated systems now. Um, um, we read out the motion and and essentially that's it, no? But then but then and this already connects to to what you mentioned about quantum. Um, it, it's not so easy anymore. If uh, if we cannot, for example, just just say, well, we look at the trajectory and then we use um, we use the first law to to uh, infer the heat. So one of the questions is how how would I how would I measure heat exchanges? Um, and um, uh, similarly, uh, and you also mentioned that. So if if I if I look beyond the harmonic oscillator. So how how would I infer really um, the work in in a more complex system? Because then suddenly suddenly I cannot so easily have a linear dependencies anymore in in my detection and so on. I need to characterize my system. So on the experimental side, um, these these are challenges in in the mere working with the system, so to say, and and not yet talking about about really implementing something specific. I think maybe, maybe I can add something that there's like intrinsic tension true. between um, having a system that is isolated from the rest of the world uh, and, and on the other hand connect to, to some environment that is that is well defined. I mean, if you want to keep um, well, quantum properties like coherence and so on, you have to be super well isolated and then you cannot just bring some hot object and you know, just... Uh, bash them together so uh, and therefore the, many times the the way to, to thermalize is a bit more cumbersome it's uh, either you completely cool and then you um, you gradually heat up to some temperature and it's not that accurate um, and, and actually creating the thermal equilibrium in some vacuum chamber is uh, many times not that simple experimentally Mm. Yeah, I, I do um, uh, share your point there. Sometimes our, our definition of allowing something to thermalize is to force our system to have the same statistics as a thermal state. And is that it's, we missed something there? I mean, you've been you've been very kind in our pre-discussions. You know, I'm thinking we've talked about out of equilibrium physics, uh, systems with fuel, uh, non-linear systems, like completely moving away from coarse graining, and and so we've moved a long way away from thermodynamics. Um, but I I would like to move the conversation on because we have 15 minutes left, and I suspect the end of our discussion will be lively. Um, so 
to me, it seems so obvious that the origin of thermodynamics of the theory was, is so classical. It's a classical physics theory, and it survived um, relativity, didn't really make a dent in it. It survived the early quantum theory for a very long time. Um, and so, Janet, I'm going to ask you, why on earth do we think that the thermodynamics can help us at all um, when thinking about quantum systems? Um, um, that, uh, I just got a message from the Zoom thing. Um, why, you asked what? Why does thermodynamics... Why would we ever think that we could use thermodynamics to learn something new about a quantum system? Is it not the other way around, sorry? Is it not that we want to use quantum physics to push thermodynamics into a new regime where it's never been properly you know, studied, as you say, because it's been much older. Um, yeah, so arguably. Yeah. Um, and so, so what, um, and so you don't, you don't think that, that there are tools that we've learned from um, thermodynamics and uh, stochastic thermodynamics, which we can apply to quantum systems. You, you think it's the other way around that there's, there's the lessons of quantum mechanics we can apply to thermodynamic systems. Well, I mean, obviously there's a dual purpose, but um, it, it's not so. Then. I mean, we, I think we do understand quantum mechanics. Of course, there's lots and lots of problems still, measurement problem here, there, there, there. But I'm not sure we're going to tackle those. I, th I think what we want to do is really pushing thermodynamic, standard thermodynamics into extreme situations such as smaller sizes, non-equilibrium, but also quantum effects and see what it means for, for thermodynamic arguments. And, and so in particular, many of us have been interested in things like what do quantum coherences do? Because quantum coherences, of course, is something that you never consider in a classical system. In, in no, and, and one of the things we have not mentioned today yet, which is uh, unfortunate, is, is statistical physics, of course, is the sort of microscopic understanding of thermodynamic laws. And when you think about statistical physics, of course, you just talk about energy shells, populations of energy levels, and, and, and so on. And, and everything is just about that. But in the quantum regime, of course, you can have things like coherences, where you're not even in a specific energy, but you, you sort of in a superposition. And that's a regime that was never considered before. So that's why we're interested in it, to, to see what happens. And, and that's just one example, of course. So I guess in that case, that um, what I'm unclear about, and I don't know if you or maybe Ram would like to respond, is, is is that is that still thermodynamics? Because then I just feel that I'm looking at the quantum mechanics of small systems. So what, why why do I use a lens in the language of thermodynamics there? Right. So first, let me add that that there are uh, additional interesting things, like uh, in, in continuation to what uh, Janet said, uh, that arise in the small scale, like strong coupling that Janet actually uh, actively studied and contributed to, and non-Markovianity quantum non-Markovianity and so on. And they're relevant for microscopic the processes that happens very fast, smaller than the scale, smaller than the relaxation times of, of the bath. I mean, people are doing now autosecond passes and so on. So uh, things can get very fast. And the, the coupling intensities could, to, the, to the environment also could be very strong. And then things start to be a bit murkier, uh, even how to define exactly the work, this interaction energy and so on. So we, it's not like everything in thermodynamics is, you know, it, it's really clear how to, uh, to express it in the, in the small scale. Um, so sorry, I forgot that. No, I, forgot I think the, the I think fine. Question. And actually just because you mentioned it, I want to take a, a slightly um, sideways step um, which is not necessarily um, a quantum one, um, which is because you were talking about uh, non Markovanity, vanity however you ever say that, so memory effects for the bath. <laughs> and I wonder, Raul, when thinking about some of these small systems and, and again, biological system and things, uh, is it fair for us to always think of this as, as just, you know, some kind of um, thermal state bath, or do we have to start worrying about, um, you know, memory in the bath and um, these topics? Uh, well, in fact, we are starting now to work on memory effects in these systems. Uh, there are many things to study there, and uh, it is also interesting to study uh, paths made of uh, active particles. That, that uh, is a hot topic also in the field. 
where the, the thermal bath is not uh, uh, due to collisions with uh, just inert molecules, but uh, baths made of uh, bacteria are uh, being considered also. So in fact, the, this field is very active in, at this scale in classical stochastic thermodynamics. The, the, the effects of uh, non Markovian thermal baths and processes, it is very interesting. And do we need to take any kind of, of, of large step um, uh, in terms of the theoretical framework that we use to describe these, or is it only a minimal modification to thermodynamics that we have to make to understand? So, so current approaches are uh, just using colored uh, noise instead of white noise. And this is, so far, it's been successful in predicting the dynamics as far as I understood. So, uh, but so, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, there are there is much information that, that that can be gained from the dynamics regarding the, na the nature of the, of the thermal bath. So I guess you could understand well how the bacteria that are colliding with your particle behave if if you if you could develop better theories and not just uh, color noise. Great. So yet again, thermodynamics still seems to hold up largely. Um, Nikolai, I, I wonder if you wanted to move some of your experiments away from having, you know, um, mechanical oscillators in a the thermal state coupled to a gas of, um, you know, actual molecules and interacting with a coherent state of light. How would you try and move some of this uh, uh, into the quantum regime so you could build a little quantum machine? Yeah, so, so, so this to doing actually um so but, but the first steps well is um is of course going to very cold very cold states of the of the mechanics which we can do by now but then then the, the individual i would say almost obvious i would go away from the we go Really, think it's interesting to them. Also, the Nikolai, Nikolai, Nikolai I, I, we, we lost, we lost you again. Um, uh, I, I tell you what, I'm just going to um, ask Janet um, a similar question because I, I know that um, she's also worked on this, but it looks like you're fully frozen now. Anyway, so Janet, how how do we try and build these maybe these thought experiments we've thought about already, but in the quantum regime? How do we try and build them? You know I'm a theorist, right? Uh, I, uh, I mean, I don't know. This is still hard, right? Um, so uh, maybe maybe from a theory point of view, then, you know, do we have to change, uh, how do we have to change our description of what a system and a bath are if we want oh, to, God, it to be yeah. fully quantum? Oof, okay, fully quantum. Uh, too many things. <laughs> Um, I, I would say that firstly, I mean, even classically, right, so the, the, the distinction between system and environment is important. There usually is always the sort of um, argument where you sort of divide and conquer. So you first have to set up what is going to be my system, what is going to be my environment, and then ideally you don't change your your split anymore because once you've made that split you you need to build your theory and also your experimental uh, analysis of what's do what is happening on onto this if you change you can violate the second law and that's why we've had 150 years of second law violation papers um so that's one of the core things that i think we all need to do now if the if the if the coupling between the system and the environment is weak weak ish then then it's relatively easy to make that distinction once you have a coupling that is stronger then it becomes really iffy right so firstly uh, so okay let me take a step back if the system and environment are weakly coupled then i can think of the environment as a i would call it bath if it has a temperature um, and i would not call it bath if it doesn't have a temperature or at least that's in my head how, how i work it um, so, so obviously there are already differences if you have, for example, a squeezed environment because it's not thermal anymore and then you can get uh, different things than what you would have uh, in, in standard thermodynamics. 
Um, and then the second thing is this strong coupling aspect where, where the system and the environment really start to interact much more strongly. The division doesn't become as obvious anymore. Mathematically, we can still do it. Also experimentally, you can still talk about what, what is the position of this particle, but actually you're really talking about in a way, new modes. So you can think of, you know, two oscillators that are not independent anymore, but actually they they sort of, you know, become become so correlated that, that, that you can't really think of one oscillator as being the system and the other, the, the environment. So clearly there are big problems with how to analyze this and how to understand it. Um, when you now also throw in quantum and ask me how to do all of this, then <laughs> it's stuck. Um, uh, but I can see that Nikolai is back. Maybe he wants to. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is the perfect time. So Nikolai, we got as far as you saying that you 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 need to have your mechanics cold, and that that is something you can realize now. And then we lost you. Okay, ma'am. Sorry for that. I don't know. I actually coupled to my mobile phone just to be sure, and then and then even this didn't work. So, um, good. Yes. So so um, going to the quantum regime. Well, I. I I think we start off with something that is that is pretty pure, and then and then there's different opportunities, like different possibilities. You no, know, we can, um, as I said before, we can manipulate the bath, for example, to going towards squeeze baths, baths, um, and uh, then of course one can ask whether this will bring much in addition as compared to just taking something thermal that is that is um, squeezed. Um, and then, but then uh, we can go away from these harmonic uh, systems where where um, where we are not using Gaussian states anymore, and um, and then it becomes already very hard. And I don't think we have all the tools to actually analyze this already. So this is something that would be very interesting to study in the experiment. Also, if we can see whether there where it's less classical if you want we could could see quantum quantum behavior um, this is speaking for mechanical systems where where we have to introduce a nonlinearity uh, in some way of course when you think of other like two level systems or gases or so you you get this for free um, and this is also the other possibility. You no know? one could start to couple to these small quantum systems and and, and investigate um, exchange with that. Great, thank you. I, I mean, I would love to have a discussion of of you know exactly what quantum properties we use and and you know if it needs to be fully quantum. But but that's a few hours on its own. So I, I'm going to try my question for Janet, but on Ram now, which is. <laughs> see if he has an opinion which is so now we're talking about squeeze bath and non-linearities and uh, two level systems and coherence and um you talked about en entanglement generation and so my question for you is why would we try or even hope to be able to use any lessons from thermodynamics to describe these systems or can we well uh... I think we do. We haven't solved everything, but but people make progress and and studied squeeze bath and and you know arrived at all sorts of uh, conclusions. Um, there is of course this always this, once you lose this initial uh, thermal initial condition, then you can ask the question: In what sense this is different from from just general quantum dynamics of initially uh, mixed state? And in particular, in the case of uh, uh, of squeeze bath, you you lose already at the beginning something that is very uh, um, you know it's, it's a key idea in thermodynamics that you can extract work from from a single bath. You have to be actually synchronized with it. You have to be in the right phase. Okay, so you lose both the robustness. On the other hand, you can gain by uh, coupling it to it like a swing. You can take uh, energy out of it. So essentially, it's more a battery than, uh, than a bath. But that being said, if you can show that, okay, it's not just a regular bat battery, okay, you, you can have some added value by the fact that it's initially thermal or there's some interesting, uh, interesting aspect, then by all means, why not? Um, That's great. And does anyone um because does anyone have any any co final comments they want to make on that or something they feel I've missed because otherwise 
Um, um, there's 15 minutes left and I would like to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. Um, so as I don't see anyone desperate, uh, please do feel free to raise your hand in Zoom and then you can you know, have your camera on if you wish or you can write a message in the chat. Um, and for those of you watching on YouTube, you can also ask questions there and they will be um, conveyed to me. Um, so just while we wait for um, uh, people to, to get themselves together, um, I think that there, I, I've taken some lessons away from this discussion at least. I mean, it seems like there's no, no end to the, the realms of applicability. Um, uh, and it, it feels like it needs, if you're working in experimental science with small things, you need to know something about about uh, thermodynamics and nanothermodynamics. Um, and um, maybe also while we're waiting for questions, I, I know that, that um, the topic of biological systems continues to be very um, interesting for people. Um, and so, uh, Janet, in that case, when you're talking about pushing thermodynamics into the quantum regime, in a biological sense, do you think that there's, by studying the thermodynamics of a biological system, we could see if there's any um, role of quantum mechanics in its dynamics or in its energetics is better? Yeah, I mean, as I, as I said at the very beginning, I think thermodynamics or more generally this, this type of field that we're talking about, not, not just the old fashioned thermodynamics, is, is, has three parts. One of them is the real application thing of, of us having cars and so on. The second one is us wanting to understand nature in a fundamental manner and, and uh, from the theoretical point of view and then experimentally realizing it and, and pushing it around to see what happens. And then the third one is really to use these new understanding that we have from, from stochastic thermodynamics uh, as well as quantum uh, aspects for uh, the, the frontier that I think is in biology, really. What can be used in biology, I can't say, uh, but I'm not claiming in any way that, uh, you know, quantum effects will be the thing that drives a certain motor or, or so a biological motor. But on the other hand, if we, if we don't even understand it from theoretical and, and controlled uh, experimental point of view, how can we judge it if we observe a biological process how can we how can we judge what happens without having you know that fundamental understanding so that's i'm not yet speculating about what will be useful i think we need the toolkit once the toolkit is is there we and and also bio experiments are, are also improving with with time we can try and apply it great thank you we have a question from Madassa. Uh, oh wait okay yeah before we move on I, to Madassa, uh, yes Ram, please we open completely the, you know the panel uh, so biology, of course, I, I agree, it's interesting. Uh, I think we, we have another player coming into the to the scene, which is uh, quantum computers. And to my mind, you know, it's, it's something like a steam engine, okay, uh, of, of this era, okay? It's this machine that we uh, don't really know how to, to handle. It is an open system. Um, and, and actually this is where we are and this is why we don't have quantum computers now doing wonderful things because it's, uh, it's an open system. Um, the initial preparation is uh, is not often not really pure. Sometimes it has initial coherence. Sometimes it's mixed. Um, the evolution itself is affected by various noise mechanisms. Some of them are really quantum. Some are less. Um, and we don't know how to solve it. So thermodynamic tools. Uh, I mean, we want to be in a regime where we can't actually solve the dynamics. Right. This is why they are interesting. Uh, but on the other hand, you need to verify that the, what you did is not complete rubbish. Um, so uh, thermodynamic toolbox may help to, this, uh, to tackle this problem of uh, uh, diagnosing, validating um, calculations in quantum computers and so on. Great, thank you. I'm sure both government and private investors will be very glad to hear someone describe quantum computers as the steam engine of the 21st century. Um, please, Madassa, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so I, I have actually two questions. Um, so one is, uh, I, I just wanted to try and understand a bit better in terms of the role of what, say, um, a non-linear system or something that's out of equilibrium would play in an engine. 
um, specifically, you know, at, at the nanoscale and, and especially in the optomechanical systems that Nikolai is talking about, th th this is very feasible. And, and whether this is an advantage um, and, and whether there's some interesting new physics, that, new ways that engines can be used or run uh, compared to, say, the macroscopic uh, uh, okay. level. And then Thank I can you. ask my second question later. <clears throat> Nikolai, do you have a, um, something to say on that? Yes. So. Um, I, I, I guess, I, I guess we will even need nonlinearities if we want to go beyond, uh, beyond doing something that is, uh, you know, looking at a trajectory and then looking, um, and seeing what we can extract and learn about the system. And my, my favorite example and experiment of this is, is the, the single atom engine, um, that was done in the schmidt kahler group, no, where, where you can actually not even um, not even have this engine going between different um, frequencies and temperatures, but you also can collect the energy in a different degree of freedom. And this mm -hmm. is essentially done via nonlinearity in this case. So, so to do this kind of thing, I, I believe uh, we, we need nonlinearities. And as a, as a second point, um, that is on the very, very practical side that I only learned recently. When you when you look at these at these energy harvesting systems that, that try to use uh, noise from the environment in order to create energy, also their nonlinearity is an important topic because um, uh, you can harvest on a broader band scale, so uh, uh, bandwidth. So you can you can actually match your harvester to to the environmental noise better. So, so also there to, to, to really de design better systems, you need to understand nonlinear dynamics, noisy dynamics. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add to that, that uh, um, it's, it's actually important in heat machines to be selective and uh, have a selective control coupling to, to the different bath. If you just constantly uh, connect your, your two baths to, to all the levels in your system, you'll just have a non-equilibrium flow from one bath to the other and nothing say, exciting will happen. So different, different um, heat machines, uh, paradigms, you know, do the selectivity differently. Some of them open up the, the oscillator, change its frequency so that it can couple with a, with a certain bath and then change it so that it will couple to a different bath. And otherwise to begin with have a, well, something like say a three level system, um, where you can selectively uh, tune and interact with different uh, with different levels and couple them to different bath, and then there is interaction inside uh, the engine uh, using some laser that scrambles the the population. Uh, if the system the, the potential is nonlinear, then you start to have different level spacing, and and then potentially you can address individual levels, and I think that's. Uh, very, it's a key element in controlling heat machines. Great, thank you. Thank you. And I've just realized that uh, I missed a very important topic, which was how to make some of these machines actually useful, but another time. But that's a, we have time for your second question. I don't see any other having come in. Okay. Um, so this is, a, in some sense, just actually building on what uh, Ram was talking about. And it's, 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 um, so, the, the and just also trying to understand, you know, we talked about um, the panelists talked about the different observables in, in macroscopic level of thermodynamics, but also the the nano level, you have some additional things, and 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 I wondered what the role of information uh, uh, played um, within once again in the sphere of, of engines, and and of course there are conceptual engines that are and, and realized engines. Well, with, with information, um, well, the Slizzard's engine, for example. But um, I, I just wondered if, if that actually is advantageous, or is this a nice uh, conceptual exercise experimentally to play with? But is this actually something that's uh, real and useful? Who thinks they can talk about information thermodynamics in less than six minutes? <laughs> Janet? I'll, I'll just say something. Um, 
So, I mean, this information energy aspect uh, and, and, and also the, well, we, we can also call it feedback, right? So, so like in the Maxwell demon experiment where, or, or thought experiment, where the demon can actually know whether a particle is fast or slow and make actions depending on that information or knowledge, that of course changes the balance of energy and, and you can extract work from that type of process. But I come back to, um, to one of the points I said earlier, you always have to divide and conquer. And, and so what happens in this thought experiment is that actually you first choose your system to be the gas uh, as, a, as a whole, but then you start treating each individual particle. And so you've just actually changed your boundary of what you call system because you can actually individually now change it. And, and, and that is why Maxwell's demon can violate the second law. Um, and, and so information, to bring in information as a concept is only helpful because we understand better how that <laughs> feedback process makes a difference to thermodynamic, um, to thermodynamic exchanges. But it's not really surprising. <laughs> I mean, so in other words, it's pretty obvious once you understand it, and I think we understand it now. So I'm not sure how much we have to still talk about it, because I think we understand it now. Yeah, that of course. Uh, there are very there are very many ways you can you can break the rules of thermodynamics if you um, play by different rules, right? Yeah, but, uh, exactly. Yeah, um, um, yeah uh, Nikolai. Just a, a little point on that. So, so the way we currently do the feedback, um, I, I I completely agree oh. with with this using information in the feedback. Well, we understand that pretty well. Um, in the, when you look at, at even when you look at the old uh, machines, then there's sometimes like inbuilt regulators, no? That that is kind of a kind of a feedback mechanism that is built into the system, and uh, and if we were able, and and I think a few ideas are, I didn't see many, <laughs> if we were able to to build this uh, feedback idea into the system itself without really using itself the power of a whole computer, but being also on the nanoscale, then, then I think the concept can actually be useful to, to, to see it, you know, have the demon in built into, into, your, into your chip, if you want. Which is, um, of course, how nature does it. Yes. Yeah. At the same time, I agree. You might also then want to, to take the demon into your system, and then you have maybe a different type of description for it. Great. Does anyone else want to say anything about thinking machines? Uh, about, about information. So, um, okay, so there, there is kind of the, the Shannon information, which actually, um, you know, give, give you a... Um, some answers to, to some questions, but uh, you can think about it more abstractly, how you can use information. And um, and I think it's interesting because sometimes at the microscopic scale, well, in the artificial um, um, experimental setups that we, we have today, I mean, and optical lattices and, uh, well, the, all the levitated uh, the sphere cylinders and so on, the, the actual underlying physics is, is known. It's not just some, you know, solid that we don't know anything about it. And then we actually, uh, the best thing is not to assume anything about it and just use uh, thermodynamics. Uh, but many times we actually know, uh, you know, we know the native Hamiltonian before the dynamics starts. Not always, but in some cases, surely in, in ion traps, uh, the, in these optical lattices and so on. And uh, the complexity comes from the from the dynamics. Okay. And one can wonder if there is this information about uh, about the underlying Hamiltonian. Can you can you somehow incorporate it into thermodynamics and get some tighter, stronger version, which is actually adapted to the system you're interested in? So you lose generality for the sake of a greater uh, prediction power for your specific system. And it was irrelevant in the classical context, but I think it is relevant for these uh, man-made systems today. Great. Well, I propose that we end there because it is uh, 29 minutes past the hour. Um, thank you all very much for that enlightening discussion. Um, and um, 
we hope to be able to invite you to an event in the future. Um, goodbye, everyone. I, I guess my dad's where I hand it back over to you now to close. Thanks, James, and, uh, you, James. Uh, and all the panelists uh, for the insightful comments and discussions. I'm sure we're all um, be learning a lot from that. Um, so before everyone goes, uh, just two things. One, um, if I could just ask the panelists to stay behind afterwards. Um, and then the rest, uh, just to let you know that uh, in two weeks time, oh wait, 1st of December, we'll have our next block starting on um, nano uh, fabricating optomechanics. Um, and so there's a series of talks on, on that. And then I'm sure that there'll be an email circular going out for you to keep an eye out for. So thank you once again and have a great November. <laughs> Thanks very much, Modessa. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, James. Bye. 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 Thank you. It's really November out there now. Yeah. <laughs> Just wait for everyone to. Um, and Clara, if you can shut the.